Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs> it's a time. Yeah. It is. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, you are tuned in to the Chabot Space and Science Center Virtual Telescope. And behind me is Nelly, our 36-inch reflector telescope, our research telescope. And I'm here with Gerald McKeegan and uh, John Curry and Rick Taft, and I'm Rich Ozer. And uh, I have to say, I have to let people know that um, this is our last regular Saturday night virtual telescope viewing because we're not going to need to be virtual anymore. Uh, the Chabot Space and Science Center is opening on the 12th of November, and that's a week away. And we're going to have live telescope viewing on the deck on Friday and Saturday nights. And uh, with any luck, it'll be back to business as usual. And uh, we'll still have virtual telescope programs. Uh, Gerald, what did they say? Maybe once a month? Once a month, uh, possibly on a Thursday evening. Yeah. Okay, great. So we'll let you know. We'll we'll let people know through the uh, usual channels uh, on the Facebook page uh, or on the Chabot website. So keep an eye out for that if you enjoy the virtual telescope programs. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully be able to oblige and uh, and do something once a month for you. Um, so anyway, that's the big news is that uh, Chabot Space and Science Center is reopening. Uh, we've appreciated all of your interest and support over the last couple of years and uh, 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 all of the people who made donations, thank you. Fremont Bank, thank you. And uh, we ask you to continue your support at the Chabot Space and Science Center by becoming a member um, or continuing to make donations on our virtual programs as they occur. Um, the other thing that I have to I have to walk something back, um, and it's not a terrible thing, but it's important for those who uh, uh, heard my message and were planning on maybe making a trip up. Uh, I had mentioned that the telescope makers workshop was probably going to reopen on November 19th. Um, we're going to be delaying that because the uh, part of the building that the Telescope Makers Workshop is in uh, is involved in the construction project uh, that won't be finished uh, uh, in time for November 19th opening. So we're probably going to delay the TMW Telescope Makers Workshop till January, probably the first Friday in January. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll send the word out. Uh, again on the EAS Facebook page, Shabo Facebook page, and uh, also on the mailing lists uh, if you are subscribers to any of those lists. So yeah, you uh, know what, Richard, for you for, yeah. you forgot one thing. Did I? You, you said that, uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said that the Shabo Space and Science Center will reopen come November twelfth, Friday, November twelfth. It's the Shabo Space and Science Center and NASA Ames Visitor ah, Center. Okay. Center, yeah. We that's are a now. To, that's a pretty are, major thing to forget. So yeah. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> yeah. If you come up here uh, on, on the 12th or anytime thereafter, you will see not only the Chabot Space and Science Center logo out in front, but you'll also see the NASA logo out in front. We are well, now, in, in all fairness to Richard, the Chabot Space and Science Center is reopening. The NASA Ames Visitor Center is opening for the first time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's right. Yeah, yeah Gerald, I, you didn't let me finish. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Good, Sorry. Good, good recovery there, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, uh, speaking of the uh, NASA Ames Research Center Visitor Center, uh, I had an opportunity for a little preview, and there are some amazing artifacts that are going to be available, including actual uh, spacesuits uh, worn by astronauts on a lunar mission, as well as um, uh, Skylab, I believe. But anyway, really terrific, interesting uh, new exhibits and artifacts. Uh, pretty much the whole first floor has been redone to uh, now it's called the uh, Studio One with all of these exhibits, including a lot of hands-on exhibits. And for those of you that, that caught a couple of weeks ago um, and a, a demonstration on what would happen if you were to leave a spacecraft into the vacuum of space, what would happen to a person? We all saw that marshmallow experiment. Well, guess what? We can do that marshmallow experiment live right for mm -hmm. you in our new Studio One. So something to uh, definitely come up and see. 
and a robot building and lots of other good stuff. Yeah, so it's going to be fun. So next weekend, come on up. We're going to have events going on all day long on Saturday and all day long on Sunday. So you definitely want to join us. By the way, has there been any word on First Fridays? Have yeah, those been? They, they, they are. They are talking about doing a First Friday starting in January, and also that being the opening of the Telescope Makers Workshop as well. So uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Great. Well, let's let's get on to some astronomy uh, tonight. Unfortunately, here at the Chippewa Space and Science Center, we do have overcast skies, so we're not going to be able to use the telescopes. But we do have a little video to to show you, uh, let you know a little bit about what's going to be in the sky tonight. If you happen to be somewhere where the sky is clear, uh, and so a little bit about the constellations. This video is produced by Don Saito, who is a longtime. Uh, Chabot volunteer and member of the East Bay Astronomical Society. So if you guys don't mind, I'll kind of share my screen and we'll okay. show you the video. Go ahead. Take, right. take it right. away. Yeah. Well, let's see it. Okay. If I can find it. There we go. Right there. And fire away. Greetings, stargazers. Well, in six more days, Chabot will open to the public again, but the status of live planetarium shows hasn't been established yet, so we'll have to wait and see a little longer. Until then, we've still got these virtual planetarium shows, and the sky waits for no one. Therefore, here is the November 2021 Sky This Month show for your education and entertainment. May the stars shine on your faces. There are people, animals, and objects up in the night sky. They've been there for millennia, but most people are unaware of them as they glide by unnoticed right over our heads every clear night. Tonight, let us explore these objects and characters and let them become our friends and familiars, just as the ancients did. To start, let's consider the reason we don't see all the constellations at once. The Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons having to do with the Earth's yearly orbital path around the sun. I want you to think about that for a moment. The constellations have seasons too. Just realizing this fully can help make knowing the constellations easier. We can only see the stars by looking away from the sun at night which changes our view of the stars as the sun makes its orbit around the sun throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, and if the moon isn't too bright, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully, but most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. When we were in the middle of the summer season, we had only about seven hours of night, as opposed to nearly 10 hours of night during the winter. But as the Earth slides along its path around the sun, the number of nighttime hours is now slowly increasing. We astronomers like it when we have more time to view the constellations. But not to worry, as it just so happens, when one pole-finding star grouping sets, another rises, Cassiopeia the Queen, also known as the Big W. As you can see, Cassiopeia is nearly straight up. Its five brightest stars make up its iconic W shape, but there are a few more fainter stars I'll point out to make its actual shape more apparent and to show how we can use it to find the North Star. The constellation of Cassiopeia is actually her throne. It's upside down in the early evening, but this star here, makes up the throne seat. Off the tip of the more squashed end of the W shape is a star here. If you draw an imaginary line from the tip of the W and that star, it points directly at Polaris, the North Star. Now, Polaris is the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is. So no matter what time of night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north, with east directly to your right, 
west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is, of course, an illusion caused by the Earth's rotation, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact it is the Earth that's spinning. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top and you extend Earth's north polar axis straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, a small constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of its bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Going back to Cassiopeia's W shape, the non-squashed end of the W points directly into the face of her husband, Cepheus, the king. He's upside down at this time, but he's got a triangular crown, a face in profile, a stylish pigtail, and he's smiling because he's the king. Rising in the northeast is an easy-to-spot constellation, Auriga, the charioteer. He's easy to spot due to his bright eye, Capella, which is one of the brightest stars in the sky. In this view, he's face up, but he's got a triangular helmet, big head, large hooked nose, and his eye, Capella. At this juncture, let us turn around and face the southern horizon. This will allow us to see the rest of the night's constellations more easily, like so. Arcing above the southern horizon, is a kind of invisible line where all of the zodiacal constellations can be found. This line is called the ecliptic and is also where the sun, moon, and planets move along. This is why the zodiacal constellations were so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology, probably none do, but astrologers were some of history's first astronomers and for their early work, we are in their debt. Starting in the east and moving to the west, we have the zodiacal constellations Taurus the bull, Aries the ram, Pisces the fishes, Aquarius the water bearer, and Capricornus the goat, who currently contains two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. If you haven't seen Jupiter and Saturn, this is your last chance before they're lost to the sun in December, and we won't see them again in the early evening until August and September of next year. Except for Taurus, the rest of this month's zodiacal constellations are pretty faint and hard to see. We'll talk about all of them and hope you can get to a nice dark sky sight so you might possibly see most of them. Starting just above the northeastern horizon, we find Taurus the bull. He's got a large, somewhat elongated, triangular head, two horns, a single line for his body, front and rear legs, and a forward-facing tail. At the end of his right-hand horn, you can see a small cluster of stars that kind of looks like a mini Little Dipper. That's the open star cluster known as Pleiades. The Japanese call it Subaru, and if you look at the medallion on the front of every Subaru vehicle, you'll see that star cluster there. To the right or west of Taurus, is Aries the ram. He's got a small flat triangular head, a somewhat squished rectangle for a body, a cute triangular tail, and front and back legs outstretched as though he was frolicking through the starry fields. To his right we find Pisces, the fishes. One fish is a triangle while the other is a circle, both connected by a large V-shaped bed of fishing line. To the right of the fishes, we find Aquarius, the water bearer, a fairly large constellation. He has an elongated diamond-shaped head, a back, two legs, and an outstretched arm holding a vessel of water that's spilling. Finally, to the right of Aquarius is Capricornus, the goat, with his horn, head, body, legs, tail, and the aforementioned planets Jupiter and Saturn. Above the ecliptic from this viewpoint, Again, starting from the east and moving west, are a number of constellations of note. 
Perseus, the hero, Andromeda, the chained lady, Pegasus, the winged horse, Cygnus, the swan, and Lyra, the harp. First up is the constellation Perseus, the hero. He's a heroic figure posed as though he's flexing his muscles, while at the same time reaching out to save Andromeda by grabbing her foot. Speaking of Andromeda, the chain lady, there she is, with a single star for her head, a neck, torso, one arm reaching up with two chains attached, and the other arm curled down. She has two legs, and her right leg raised and bent at the knee. That single star representing Andromeda's head is the eastern corner of the Great Square, an asterism that is made from two constellations. An asterism is not a constellation. It is only a familiar star grouping, several of which can be found in the night skies as part of single constellations or can be made up from two or more constellations. Just above Andromeda's raised knee is the Andromeda galaxy. It is the furthest thing from Earth that can be seen with the naked eye and is about 2.5 million light years from us. If it were bright enough to see the whole thing, it would appear to us to be about as wide as six full moons. To the right of Andromeda, and partially comprised of the other three corners of the great square asterism, we find the constellation Pegasus, the winged horse. The three stars make up Pegasus' wings, and he's got a body, four legs, and long horsey nose as he soars through the starry skies. To the right of Pegasus, we find the majestic constellation Cygnus, the swan, with his broad sweeping wings, long neck and nose, and his bright tail star, Deneb. He's a summer constellation, so with winter coming, he'll disappear into the daylight sun in the west and won't come back to the evening skies until next summer. The same goes for Lyra, the lyre, which is small Greek harp, and not someone who tells on truce. It contains one of the brightest stars in the sky, Vega. Again, we'll lose Lyra to the daylight by next month and won't see it again in the early evening until next summer. Bye, Lyra and Cygnus. See you next year. And that's it. There are other smaller or fainter constellations out there which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book the Stars, A New Way to See Them, by the author H. A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts were drawn. The astro-scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations. So, for convenience, they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book, which can be purchased from Amazon.com for about $18. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars that are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned, there are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good telescope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to help you get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. 
This will really help our channel to grow, which would make us all very happy. And until we meet again, we'll see you in the future. So in, the <laughs> in the future. In the future, will we all speak Back with an future. echo? <laughs> <laughs> well, if we're in Zoom, then most of Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Speaking about in the future, I really hate to eclipse whatever somebody else might have been wanting to uh, uh, say, but I think, Gerald, uh, you need to eclipse us with some information. <laughs> well, yes. Whoa, speaking of in, in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Still Speaking of this this decades. month in the near future, in fact, on for those of us here in, in uh, on the West Coast, um, Thursday night, the eighteenth of August or of November, August, geez, the eighteenth of November into <laughs> early morning of Friday the nineteenth, we will have a lunar eclipse. And in fact, it will be nearly a total lunar eclipse. Technically, it's a partial lunar eclipse because a small sliver of the moon won't be in the Earth's shadow, but uh, we will have that lunar eclipse on the night of the 18th into the morning of the 19th. And I've got some, uh, some graphics to show you to kind of tell you a little bit about what's going on. Uh, let's see, I'll start with one here. This gives you an idea of what the timing will be. Um, the Earth's shadow really uh, consists of two parts, kind of two concentric rings. The outer shadow is called the penumbra. It's a very faint shadow. Um, it's kind of the effect that you would get if uh, you were looking back at the Earth and seeing a partial sunset. Um, so it's a little bit darker, but it's not a whole lot darker. The inner shadow is called the umbra and that's the true shadow of the earth that's where the sun is completely blocked by the earth and that shadow that the moon is going to pass into the shadow uh starting on the night of the 18th for those of us here on the west coast at 10:02 p.m uh it will enter the uh the penumbra you won't notice much at that time. It would be kind of a faint uh, shadow. You might just barely notice that things are starting to get a little darker on the moon, but not very much so. But um, at 11.19 p.m., uh, it will begin to enter the umbra, the darker shadow. And it will reach maximum eclipse at 1.04 a.m. on the morning of the 19th. And then it will exit that darkest shadow at 2.47 a.m. Uh, on the 19th. So this is what's going to happen. And I've, I've got a little um, uh, slideshow here I want to share with you to show you a little bit about what's going on here. If I can get this to work right. Where's my thing? Are you, are you guys seeing this? Uh, what are you trying to get to? Uh, uh, so that stop share right there. Oh, oh. oh. now we see it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was showing the, the, the movie still on, on my screen. So, okay. All right. Yeah. So, so what I want to do now, hopefully I'm going to get to um, a PowerPoint. Do you see a PowerPoint? Yep. Yes. Yeah. That's All right. right. Okay. So. We will have a lunar eclipse on uh, the official date is the 19th, although for us here at, uh, in, in the Bay Area and on the West Coast, it will start actually late at night on the 18th of November. And so I just wanted to share with you what's going on. So you got the moon or the Earth orbiting around the sun, and then you have the moon orbiting around the Earth. And the moon's orbit around the Earth uh, orbits about, on average, about 238, 239,000 miles away from the Earth. The orbit of the moon is not directly over the Earth's equator, and it's not directly parallel to the Earth's orbit around the sun, what we call the ecliptic. And actually, there's a little bit of an angle uh, between the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of 
uh, the moon. It's about a five degree angle or so. And because of that, sometimes the moon is a little bit above the plane of the Earth's orbit. Sometimes it's a little bit below the plane of the Earth's orbit. And the direction of this tilt changes throughout the year. So uh, most of the time when you have a full moon, the moon is either a little bit above the plane of the Earth's orbit or it's a little bit below the plane of the Earth's orbit. But if you get to just the right time, the, the uh, point where that orbit crosses the plane of the orbit is directly opposite the Earth from the sun. And that's when we get lunar eclipses. So what's going to happen is the moon's in its orbit, uh, is approaching a uh, full moon, and the Earth's shadow is projected out into space. Now, I'm just using some graphics here to show the shadow. You actually don't really see it like this. Uh, so the, the shadow is projecting out into space, and it's crossing the orbit of the moon. So when the, when the moon first approaches the shadow, you see the moon at its full brightness. But as it begins to enter into the shadow, it starts to fade a little bit. And initially, it won't fade very much. It just gets a little bit dimmer. And you, you at first, you don't realize it's happening at all. So, you know, we'll be up here at, uh, at Chabot watching it. And we'll all be saying, oh, it's entering the shadow. And everybody and people will be looking and saying, I don't see anything. Uh, that's normal. The, the penumbra shadow is not very dark, especially when, when the moon is first entering that shadow. But then the moon enters the umbra. And that's when you start seeing a distinctly dark shadow begin to pass over the moon. And as it projects and gets all the way into the shadow, the moon turns that kind of rusty red color. Now, the image that you see here is an image of the moon taken during a previous uh, eclipse. That particular eclipse was when the Earth's shadow was kind of a little low on the moon. So you see the very top of the moon is a little bit bright in this image. The, the eclipse that we're going to have on the 19th of November, it's going to be the opposite. The bright patch is going to be down at the bottom of the moon rather than at the top. So it's in the full shadow, which that the, the full shadow, the umber shadow is kind of reddish in color. And I'm going to explain to you why in a couple of minutes here. And then as the moon continues in its orbit, it eventually passes out of the Earth's orbit. And we see the dark shadow begin to slowly slip away from the moon and it pretty soon gets back into the penumbra and then eventually out of the penumbra back to being its normal brightness. So all this is going to happen very late uh, at night. Uh, again, it starts at a little bit after 10 o'clock on, on the night of the 18th. Um, and then it continues on to about 2.45 or so in the morning of the 19th. Um, question that comes up all the time is why is the umbra red so i got some graphics here it's kind of a crude graphic but hopefully you'll get the idea here so you have the earth out there orbiting around the sun and the sun is shining on one side of the earth when the sun shines on one side of the earth it creates a shadow on the other side of the earth now you would expect based on your experience here on the ground that that shadow would be uniformly dark but you got to remember that the Earth has an atmosphere, and that atmosphere, though it's very thin compared to the size of the Earth, it is there, and sunlight passing through that atmosphere gets refracted, and by that I mean the light gets bent, and different parts of the rainbow of colors in the sunlight get bent different amounts. And so what happens is you get bending of the light such that atmospheric uh, refraction scatters the blue kind of away from the shadow, but it bends or refracts the red portion of the spectra into the dark shadow of the earth. And that, for that reason, you end up getting a reddish shadow on the moon. Now, just to give you a different perspective of all this, this is what it would look like if you were standing on the North Pole of the moon, looking back toward the earth during uh, a lunar eclipse. Uh, 
the moon or the earth rather would be blocking the sun but what you would get is what appears to be like a a late sunset all the way around the perimeter of the earth so you know that here on earth when we get a sunset after the sun has actually dropped down below the horizon but just barely below the horizon we get a red sunset well from the perspective of the moon they're seeing a red sunset all the way around the perimeter of the earth and that's why you get the red color on the earth so that's the explanation pretty uh, good so the earth yeah, is a lens the earth is kind of like a lens yeah the, the earth's atmosphere actually is kind of like mm -hmm. a lens so so this particular uh moon is going to be called the beaver moon and you might wonder well why is it called the beaver moon well it turns out that native americans gave names to each of the full moons during the course of the year basically based on what's going on that particular season or that month of the year so we have a whole bunch of names the wolf moon in january snow moon in february worm moon pink moon flower moon strawberry moon buck moon in july sturgeon moon in august the corn moon or the harvest moon in september and the hunter's moon in october and the beaver moon in november and then in december we have the cold moon aptly named <laughs> so that's how we come up with all these different names so this month's full moon is called the beaver moon and it will be a lunar eclipse so stay up late on the night of the 18th or get up really early on the morning of the uh uh of the 19th i'm, I'm sorry stay up late on the 18th or get up very early in the morning on the uh, 19th and you'll see the lunar eclipse and don't forget uh, to build a dam <laughs> <laughs> all right okay i'm gonna stop my share here there you go all right so um anybody have any questions about that feel free to share yeah let's let's, uh, yeah. let's open this to questions about eclipses in general and the moon in general and then we'll move on to some other topics yeah, while you guys are doing that let's uh let's put up the photo we had from the super flower Oh, Blood good moon. idea. Yeah. So <laughs> I just want to uh, apologize to the folks that are on YouTube. We've got somebody who's uh, trying to misuse our live stream on YouTube right now. So Richard is working right now to delete those offensive uh, uh, posts on there. Uh, I do apologize for that. And hopefully we can get this guy to stop doing that uh it's the, the downside of trying to do live streaming you and every once in a while get people on there you really would wish would go away you know? so, yeah. social right. media i'm allowed to I, I can make them go away for five minutes at a time <laughs> <laughs> well you're going to be very busy then, right? yeah that's right it's, it's exactly right <laughs> To everyone's benefit. Rick, and, is that your picture or somebody else's picture? No, this this is our picture. Yeah, this ah. is this is a picture we took through uh, the five inch finder scope on Nelly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty six yeah. inch uh, reflector. Yeah. So yeah, this was taken right here at uh, Chabot Space and Science Center, and it very nicely illustrates the uh, the reddening of the atmosphere that uh, that Gerald just spoke of. And now this was taken at a, at a previous um, a lunar eclipse. And as I said before, this in this particular lunar eclipse, it was the top part or the northern part of the moon that was a little bit in sunlight. You can see up there. But the one that we're going to have on November 19th, it's going to be the other way around. It's going to be the bottom or the south end of the moon that's going to be slightly in sunlight. Uh, so you'll see a bright uh, uh, south end of the moon instead of the north end like you see in this image but the rest of the moon will be that kind of rusty red color and one thing i i forgot to mention is we're going to live stream it from here at chavo space and science center so beginning at uh, i believe we said 11 o'clock on the night of the 18th we are going to have at least two cameras and maybe three cameras on our telescope and we will be live streaming this 
weather permitting, obviously. Um, and we'll talk about what's going on and let you watch it. And you can hang in there with us until about 2.30 in the morning and watch the whole thing happen. So I hope you get a chance to join us. And you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, that's a Thursday night. I got to go to work on Friday morning. No, you don't. This is more important than work. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is work to some of us. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah for some of us. Yeah, for some of us, it feels like work. That's right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And anyway, you know, I was thinking since this is California, uh, we may we should start our own tradition. To me, this looks more like a Merlot moon, but that's Merlot just me. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right, so I'll you're gonna so you're gonna bring a bottle of Merlot, right? <laughs> yeah. right. I, I would be happy to do so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking, but what else is going on? Well, speaking of astronomical timings, uh, and this isn't really astronomical, but. Don't forget to set your clocks back an hour back. at two o'clock <laughs> in the morning, tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. Reset Politically that. astronomical yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah reset, reset your clock to normal standard time. I emphasize yes. normal time. Normal time. <laughs> normal time. Forget about that daylight saving time. If they ever st decide to stop changing clocks, we should change back to normal standard time, which is consistent with how our bodies experience the clock. And then you could be certain they will do the opposite. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. But uh, in any case, don't forget, you do get an extra hour of sleep uh, tomorrow. So right. enjoy it. Uh, and you'll, you'll be able to save up that extra energy for the eclipse. Right. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, this also means not only do we have to set our clocks back, but anything with a time clock, like your thermostats, your coffee maker timers, oh, yeah. microwave God. timers, and, and it goes on and on. So uh, in the fall, we fall back. Why yeah. Not to mention all of your computers. Fortunately, a lot, do a lot of those, they yeah. should be automatic. I think. Yeah, they should be. Yeah. You know, yeah. if we would just follow the example of Hawaii and Arizona, right. and Guam and Puerto Rico, uh, and just not do daylight saving time at all, we wouldn't be having this problem. We'd all be fine. <laughs> Astronom By the way, astronomers <laughs> don't like daylight saving time. No, yeah, might you, have, could, might have you can tell that. that. <laughs> That's right. That's it. All right. What else is going on? All right. Well, you know, there's uh, a couple of stories this week, some interesting ones. Yeah. Uh, one rather humorous one, which I think I'd kind of like to start with. So in uh, 2019, <laughs> I'm going to actually show uh, share a picture here for a second. Let me go ahead and find my Zoom icons, which are hiding from me. And here it is. Okay, so this is the Parkes Radio Telescope down under. It's in Australia. And uh, in 2019, they received a signal in this radio telescope uh, that appeared to be coming from the direction of Proxima Centauri. And Proxima Centauri is um, in the constellation uh, Centaurus, and it's called Proxima Centauri because it's uh, a star that's pretty close, right? And uh, the, what was interesting about this signal was that it was very consistent in its tone, and uh, it did some kind of interesting frequency shifts. And all of the astronomers who were out there saying, we are trying to detect you know, other civilizations with our radio telescope said, hey, if there is a signal from uh, another civilization, it might very well sound something like this. So some people got very excited about it, but uh, over the last couple of years, uh, cooler heads have prevailed, and it was uh, decided officially that the signal that they heard and the space aliens that they heard were us. 
<laughs> and they oh, were no. uh, basically picking up electronic interference from some sort of um, radio emitting device that could have been anywhere from, you know, 50 feet to, uh, you know, a thousand miles away, depending on the nature of the equipment. And uh, it is uh, no longer uh, considered a uh, possible signal from other civilizations. But the uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up is uh, this is a perfect example of why uh, radio astronomers are so concerned about uh, uh, radio wave pollution from whether it's cell phones or whether it is other types of electronic equipment, um, it has a tendency to interfere with radio astronomy, whether that is radio astronomy to do research on uh, uh, deep sky objects or radio astronomy to try to pick up uh, uh, signals from potentially other uh, civilizations in the universe. Uh, most of the time, though, we're going to be hearing ourselves and uh, it's one of the reasons uh, some radio uh, telescopes are uh, located as far away from civilization as possible. And it's also why some people talk about putting radio telescopes on the far side of the moon or other crazy ideas like that, just to hide the telescope from our own electronic noise. So uh, that was my little story about parks. We heard the aliens and they are us. They heard the aliens and they are us. That's right. Or we found the aliens and they are us. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can figure out how to close this uh, control now. Here we go. Stop share. Yeah, this this is really a concern in, in a lot of ways, not just with the radio telescopes, but you know, when we send spacecraft out uh, to visit other other planets. Um uh, they go through quite a bit of sterilization and decontamination processes because we don't want to send a rover to Mars and have it look for life and find life and discover only that it turns out it was the life that was brought to Mars by another space probe right. that wasn't right. thoroughly clean before it took off. Um, so uh, that's, you know, we, we call it planetary protection, but it's actually to protect other planets and the moons of other planets from contamination by the Earth uh, as we send space probes out into, into space. All right. I have another thing for you. All right. All right. So uh, some of you who have been, uh, you know, amateur astronomers for a while, uh, and, uh, you know, like purchasing books on astronomy or telescope makers and want to purchase books on telescope making. One of the go-to companies for a very long time for uh, uh, buying uh, materials on astronomy, uh, you know, nice moon atlases, uh, how-to books on mirror making, all that kind of thing. Um, we used to go to Wilman Bell, which was a publisher uh, that was well known for its science books and its astronomy books. And even uh, for telescope makers in particular, they even sold kits for uh, uh, grinding and polishing uh, uh, telescope mirrors as part of their uh, book business of all things. Um, and, and sadly, Wilman Bell uh, closed their doors, went out of business uh, about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, but, the good news is that, and I'm going to share this screen here. The good news is that the folks who uh, took over Sky and Telescope uh, have uh, obtained all of the intellectual property from Wilman Bell and are slowly but surely reprinting all of their book collections. And uh, if you go to shopatsky.com, and yes, this is a shameless plug, shopatsky.com, and click on Wilman Bell, you can see how they have started putting out uh, some of the well-known books that Wilman Bell published, uh, including, and they're already out of stock, uh, the Night Sky Observer's Guide, which is a great uh, two-volume 
uh, set of books on uh, observing uh, 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 NGC objects and Messier objects and uh, other um, uh, uh, interesting deep sky objects uh, when you're in a dark sky location. There's that one, there's the book uh, on the D Dobsonian telescope, and various others uh, that are worth um, uh, checking out on this website. The other thing I noticed is even though they don't have the Ruckel uh, lunar atlas yet, they do have these field maps of the moon and uh, as well as a mirror image version, if you like uh, being able to uh, work with a mirror image field map. Um, but uh, they have the field maps of the moon that are illustrated by Ruckel. And so these are very nice uh, moon atlases that fold out uh, while you're doing uh, lunar astronomy. Uh, and it's only 14 bucks to have like a really top notch, high quality uh, um, uh, chart. Uh, alongside your telescope. So anyway, that's, hey, uh, hey, Rich, yeah. could could you go back to the book page? Yeah. So scroll down about halfway down, a little far right there, and you see the book that says astronomical algorithms. Yes. If you are into the mathematics of oh, yeah. astronomy and the motions of the planets the motions of the moons and how to predict when the next eclipse is going to be that's the book to get it's a great book by a, a belgian uh, astronomer named jane Maus, and uh, he is quite old but he is still around yeah. and um, uh, that book is just chock full of all kinds of equations and explanations of the mathematics involved in doing this. Uh, if you are inclined towards mathematics, you would love this book. So I highly recommend it. I have it at home and it's, I've got all kinds of dog ears and <laughs> inserts and things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've seen uh, this book. It is quite excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the one that we use quite frequently in our Telescope Makers Workshop is this one here uh, by uh, David Krieg and Richard Berry, uh, both of whom uh, live here on the west coast of the United States. Uh, uh, Richard Berry actually raises llamas these days. He's doing less telescope making and more, uh, more, uh, more, uh, more llama raising. Uh, but David Krieg is still uh, uh, one of their, our foremost uh, mirror makers in the Western United States. Um, this is a great book on how to design and build um, a Dobsonian telescope. So yeah, I highly say, recommend this one as well. Say, Rich, uh, I'm kind of curious. So. This is a really nice book on how to make a Dobsonian telescope, but could you share with uh, with our viewing audience what uh, what what type of uh, uh, tools are available or training is available if somebody would like to come up to the telescope makers workshop uh, and actually start their own mirror? Well, thank you for that segue. Uh, yeah. That, uh, very good. As I had mentioned, uh, we have a telescope makers workshop here at the Chabot Space and Science Center that in normal times met every Friday night from seven o'clock to 10 o'clock. We uh, obviously had to close for uh, COVID and uh, we will be reopening this activity uh, starting in at this point, the target is uh, beginning of January. Uh, and what we are able to do is teach you how to take a piece of glass, basically a disc of glass, and turn it into a high quality and very accurate uh, telescope mirror that is accurate within, you know, a tenth or an eighth of a wavelength of light. And, uh, and give you some instruction on how to build the rest of the telescope around it. These tend to be one year long projects and uh, we tend to have anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen students at a time um, working uh, on Friday nights on this project and doing some work at home as well. Uh, and uh, we're one of about, I don't know, uh, eight, nine telescope workshops uh, around the country 
Uh, uh, isn't it the oldest one or the second we're, oldest? We're, we're, we're the oldest operating one at this point, yep, I believe. Yep, yep, yeah. yep. And yep. Uh, the uh, Chabot Telescope Makers Workshop uh, started in the uh, late 30s uh, of uh, the uh, 20th century. And uh, the other notable workshops, there's one in, um, uh, in Maryland. Uh, there's one in Santa Barbara. There's one in Arizona. Uh, there's one in San Francisco right across the bay from us. And uh, those are just a few of them uh, uh, off the top of my head. There used to be one in Chicago at the Adler Planetarium, but that one closed uh, several decades ago, and they have not replaced it with anything that I know of. Um, and then I, every once in a while, read about one in different parts of the world. Uh, they're not that common. But uh, we've tried to keep ours going for, a, uh, you know, for several generations here. So uh, anyway, check it out. Yeah, one, yeah, one, one comment yeah. I'd like to make about that. Um, you know, you get the idea, well, they're, they're making an amateur telescope and it's probably OK. But, the, the, you know, professionally built ones that you buy at, uh, you know, telescope stores, things are probably better. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of these amateur made telescopes are as good or even better than a commercially made uh, Dobsonian telescope. So don't discount the quality of these just because you made it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons to do it yourself um, because it's, it needs to be about cost also, right? You make it yourself and save hundreds of dollars. But now, you know, stuff is so cheap from, uh, uh, from Asia, you know, you're able to get, you know, usable Dobsonian telescopes for, you know, just a few hundred dollars from China. But the difference is in the amount of time spent in making the primary mirror. So when you have a mass produced primary mirror of a, uh, of a Newtonian or Dobsonian telescope, you know, the best you can expect is a quarter wave uh, of accuracy. That means one quarter wavelength of light uh, of error in the figure of the uh, uh, of the parabolic shape of that primary mirror, um, and uh, when you do it yourself, you can uh, far exceed that error rate and uh, far ex actually far exceed that quality and get to about uh, an eighth wave or a tenth wave, and uh, so you end up with a better better telescope for the same price. All right, all right, thanks, guys. Yep. Hey, Michelle on Facebook asks, you know, we're talking about that um, astronomical math book. She wants to know if uh, it will help with time travel. I don't know the answer to that, but if you do find out that it does, go back to sometime before tonight, tell us, and we'll get it on the show tonight. <laughs> we'll, be, right. we'll, we'll be able to answer definitively. <laughs> well, you know, the other possibility is that if you pick up that book, uh, late at night, you may find oh. that you are instantly transported eight hours into the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. However, if you are interested in time and the different ways we measure time, uh, it is a good book to get because uh -huh. there is actually more than one way to measure time. And I'm not just talking about standard time versus daylight saving time. I'm talking about things like dynamical time, uh, baryonic uh, dynamical time, uh, universal time, coordinated universal time, uh, uh, solar time, local solar time. These are all different ideas. Ephemeris time. These are all different ways of measuring time. It's really quite a fascinating subject. And there's a lot of that covered in that book. How are we doing on questions? What have we got? A lot of comments tonight. A lot of thank yous. Yeah, oh, you're you're all thank welcome. You, but uh, yeah, we're well, still we're still going to do this. We're just going to do. We're still going to do month. this, but yeah, right, it, it, right. it does we're feel done. like we're we're kind of closing a chapter behind yeah, us a little bit. Yeah. it would have yeah, been yeah. nice to go out with a bang and have a beautiful clear sky tonight and be showing uh, stuff to the camera. But go, uh, go out with a big bang, you mean? Yeah, Why big bang. The big bang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but we, yeah. we sure appreciate it. We've gotten a lot of nice comments from people over the last couple of years. And yeah, it's been uh, fun. You've all, you've all been very kind. 
Well, what I think is funny is when I have people come up to me in the store and say, oh, yeah. I watch you guys every Saturday <laughs> night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's actually happened to me, too. Yeah, it's happened yeah, to me at, yeah. at, at local Pete's Coffee and a couple of other places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. So anyway, uh, you know, if you have any other questions you want to ask us, sorry, we are not able to look through the telescope tonight. Unfortunately, yeah. we are clouded over tonight uh, here at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Um, and I think we're actually expecting a little bit of rain uh, later on tonight. Yeah, um, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So we weren't able to use the telescope tonight, but we try to, uh, you know, give you a few science lessons and a little bit about astronomy and what's going on in the, the world of astronomy. And oh. we are going to try to continue doing that. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bob Schock here, who's actually always helpful with uh, uh, comments and corrections. Um, I don't know how I could have forgotten this, but of course, the oldest telescope makers workshop is associated with the Stellafane oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 telescope making conference that happens once a year at Porter Ranch uh, in, uh, in Vermont. And uh, that is definitely the oldest uh, telescope making institution in the United States. Um, so he mentioned that and he mentioned uh, the Boston uh, uh, Astronomy Club as well, which runs a telescope makers workshop. Yeah, the, the other thing I think we should bring up again uh, is that while this is the last virtual telescope program on a Saturday evening, it's not going to be the last virtual telescope program. We're going to be continuing with this. I'm seeing questions come up in Facebook uh, yeah. to that regard. So Yeah, again, YouTube yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, so we're, we're going back to our normal uh, Friday, Saturday night public viewing where, we'll, where we will have all three of our telescopes available. Uh, but we will be continuing with virtual telescope on a monthly basis. And I guess that that exact date has yet to be nailed down, yeah, but yeah. we'll be yeah. soon. Yep. Yep. And you'll you'll be able to find out by going to the Chabot Space and Science Center website and uh, going to the observatory page. And we'll have something there about our virtual telescope programs as, as we continue to do them. That is ChabotSpace.org. Right. Of course, your out. very next opportunity to see us again is uh, that the night of the <laughs> the uh, eclipse, uh, yes. November eighteenth, uh, starting around eleven o'clock at night uh, Pacific time, um, we'll be on the air again, and hopefully the weather will be clear and we'll be able to uh, show you uh, the eclipse. Uh, if it turns out that the weather is not going to be good that night, we're going to refer you to one of the many other sites around the country that are going to be doing essentially the same thing. So one way or the other, you'll get to see it. Of course, yep. if you can go outside and look from your own backyard, that's even better. Or come up to Chabot and see us. Yeah, in we really on, want to invite you all to come visit yeah. us on Friday and Saturday nights once we reopen. And Definitely. uh uh, not only is there going to be a lot of new stuff to see here, but um, it's just uh, a great way to, you know, figure out how to get out in the world again and, uh, uh, and yeah. do something interesting and, and look through our telescopes. And um, at least uh, two or three of us uh, will be here on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, any other questions popping up? Uh, I see lots of cool comments. Well, but, yeah, yeah, lots, lots, of, lots of, of really comments. nice comments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate it. Yep, yep. Okay, well. Well, as the song goes, we'll meet again. Yeah. Or <laughs> don't know we where, don't again. know when. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want us to start singing now. <laughs> no, 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 we're no, not going to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how, how's this one? For those of you yeah, yeah. Who, are, who are really old and used to live in the Bay Area back, say, 50 years ago or so, I'll be seeing you subsequently. <laughs> see how many people remember that one <laughs> yeah how many right. people are googling it right now yeah, yeah, right, right. Check that out. i'll give you a hint mayor art <laughs> yeah mayor art yep okay all right everyone well thank you everybody yep. and take care and we'll see, to see you up here, here in person i hope yeah yep. yeah good night right. good, good night, night everybody all. good night everybody Bye.